All right. How's it going, everyone? Um, let's dive in. So this is an overview of the argument assignment sheet. Um, so it'll be due December the 5th, which is the last official day of class. Um, if you end up needing an extension or something like that, let me know. Um, yeah, so let's dive in. Um, so the purpose of an argumentative text is to present a specific and detailed position. And one thing it's important to understand is some students kind of struggle with where the what the difference is between an opinion and what sort of uh, an argument um ultimately there's no difference between your opinion and, and the thing that you're arguing that's that's ultimately what you're doing the argument is a the formal way of presenting your opinion it's a the, the strongest possible way of presenting what is ultimately your opinion now i prefer to say belief an opinion is something like, it's my opinion that um, fall is the best season, right? I don't have like a formal argument where I really, really deeply considered why I like fall better than, say, spring. It's just something I sort of feel. Um, and so it's just my opinion. It's just something that I, I hold simply because I, I hold that position. And a belief is something like, it is my belief um, in a certain religion or a certain political um, uh, party or something like that, something that I've like thought about. I've, I've put in the minimal amount of consideration in why I hold those beliefs. Um, and so beliefs and opinions are only slightly different. Again, a, an opinion is something you just sort of hold just because you do. A belief is something that you've interrogated in some way. You've, you've put in some kind of at least a minimal amount of consideration. Now, an argument is more on the belief side. that You hold a certain belief, and an argument is a way of formally presenting that belief in a way that is supported and in a way that is meant to be persuasive. That's ultimately what will determine whether or not you have a good argumentative essay is whether or not it is it is persuasive um and that is ultimately itself going to be kind of founded on your ability to support your positions and so again the purpose of an argumentative text is to present a specific and detailed position so these positions are most effective when they are related to a modern problem or a philosophical question that's sort of the two ends of the spectrum when it comes to things that arguments tend to be about. Arguments are either derived from problems we see in the world and we're sort of considering how do we solve these problems? Well, we put forth arguments of, you know, I think this is going to be the best solution. I believe that this is the path we should take. And here's an argument for why I think that this path will lead us to the best solution or more abstract philosophical questions. You know, how, what is love? You know, what is war? You know, when is war called for versus when is war not called for? Um, what are the ethics of love? What are the ethics of war um, and and things like that? Those sort of bigger questions that matter, that it, it, it matters how we understand what love is, how we judge what is and is not love. It matters how we think about war and how we judge the ethics of what is and is not permissible in, during wartime. So these are the sort of two ends of the spectrum. And now all essays are going to kind of be somewhere um, on that spectrum. You know, you may be looking at a modern problem and then trying to make a more grounded argument, but you kind of go into some philosophical questions and stuff like that. But you're going to kind of lean one way or the other. Your essay is going to be more focused on a philosophical question, you know, exploring an abstract idea, you know, trying to pin down a definition of something like love or war. Um, or it's going to be about a modern problem. We're saying we're looking at a specific phenomenon or series of events or historical position and saying, you know, we need to solve this specific real world thing this specific way. The position that you wish to take is ultimately the thesis of your essay. If you're trying to say, you know, love is this, I'm defining love in this very specific way. 
Um, that's your thesis. That's ultimately what you're trying to accomplish with the paper is to persuade your audience that this is the best definition of love. Um, the success of a paper is not determined by the position you take. Your reader doesn't ultimately care how you define love. That's not really what makes your essay interesting or persuasive. Um, but rather in your ability to present that position strongly using things like evidence or reasoning to support your position. So your reader and, and myself, when I'm grading your paper, I don't care what you think. I care how and why you think it. That's really what matters and, and what you're going to be judged on. You can take any position that you want, a radical position, you know, a safe position. I don't care. What I care about is, can you defend that position? Can you present those ideas strongly, um, logically, in a way that's persuasive so that when I get done reading the paper, I can at least see myself holding that position. I can see myself saying, you like, you know what? That's a good definition of love. Even if I don't necessarily agree with it, I can at least see from that perspective and see that that's a strong way of defining love. Um, so hopefully that makes sense, that it's not the position. You can put, place yourself in any position that you want. Um, what matters is can you support it? Can you present that in a strong way? So... Arguments are composed of two elements, multiple premises and a single conclusion. So this is what we've kind of been working in on going up to to the break. And hopefully you, you know, retain some of that. Um, that what I'm going to expect to see is a, a well-structured argument that it's not just sort of jumping all over the place and um, that you have a conclusion that's really clearly stated as your thesis statement, and then a series of premises that have a strong relationship to that conclusion, where if the premises are shown to be true, then the conclusion has necessarily, logically, been shown to be true. Premises and conclusions should have a strong correlation so that if the premises are shown to be true, then the conclusion necessarily must be true. Going back to our um, the, the, the kind of eternal example, um, all men are mortal, premise one. Socrates was a man, premise two. What follows, Socrates was mortal. There is not a universe we can imagine in which premise one and two are true, but, prim or, but the conclusion doesn't follow. So I've given an example, premise one, AI has taken many jobs. Premise two, being an artist is a job. What follows necessarily from that? AI will take artists' jobs. Um, so then in the assignment sheet, I'm going to kind of lay out how one would go about writing that essay based on that example argument. So if I were to write an essay in which I am presenting this position, then my conclusion, AI will take artists' jobs, would be my thesis statement. You know, my as I'm writing my introduction, I'm moving toward that idea. That's ultimately what I'm telling my reader hey, AI will take artists' jobs. And if you don't believe that, keep reading. Or if that worries you, keep reading. Or if you're interested in that, keep reading. But ultimately, that's what you want to hit your art or your audience with as soon as possible, um, meaning in your introduction, is that conclusion, the thing that this is where we're headed toward. This is the thing um, that this whole essay is about. Um, I would present that statement in my introduction, and the body of my essay would focus on the premises. Um, so the whole idea is then to say, like, okay, I've made this claim. I've made this statement. AI will take artist jobs. Now, how do I prove it? Well, I have to make other claims. I have to make smaller claims that build toward that larger claim. Um, each paragraph would focus on one premise. And would give supporting evidence, such as a source giving statistics or quotes from authorities in the field of art or AI in this case. Um, and that's what's really important. A lot of, of, of young writers really struggle with clarity because they have all these ideas and they know uh, they've thought through their, their ideas, um, their topic, their argument, and they just sort of free associate ideas. They just start writing and what they end up doing is writing these really dense paragraphs that are making several claims. And because they're moving through them so quickly, none of them are supported. You have just one claim after another after another, and the reader the whole time is going, nothing has been proven. You haven't shown anything. All you've done is make a bunch of statements, um, but you haven't convinced me of anything. Um, 
If my XA succeeds in proving that each of my premises are true, then my conclusion that AI will take our jobs will also be successful. It is important to note that uh, for your own essay, you will likely need more than one paragraph for each premise. So if you just did one paragraph for each premise and your argument only has two premises, obviously a, a one a, an introduction, two body paragraphs and a conclusion is not going to cut it. It's not going to be long enough. And so your premises, it takes more than one piece of evidence to prove a premise. If I'm going to say AI has taken many jobs, right, and I have one paragraph in which I give statistics that it has taken a bunch of cashier's jobs, that's not enough because the, the reader might say like, okay, well, it's true in that extremely specific case, but there are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of other genres of jobs that AI hasn't taken. How do I know that what you presented is the outlier, isn't the outlier rather than the rule? What you need to be able to say is that the premise is the rule, that it is more is true more often than it is not true. So that takes multiple pieces of evidence. In one paragraph, I'd say it's taking cashier's jobs. And then in the next, I would say um, that the IBM AI has taken a bunch of accountants' jobs. Um, I might show that. Uh, in another paragraph that a bunch of hedge funds are being now run by AI algorithms and things like that. So it might take three, four, five paragraphs. Um, what you don't want to do is mix your statistics where you're in one paragraph saying it's taking cashier's jobs and accountant's jobs. Um, now, you may be specific cases where you could say, you know, accountants and hedge fund managers because those are so closely related. But you really want to take your time and let each paragraph kind of be about one statistic or, or one quote where you're really carefully showing how it's supporting it. And it's not enough to just to give the statistic and then move on. You have to, you know, use your words, use your, your ability to reason and show, OK, AI has taken cashier's jobs. Um, how is being a cashier like being an artist? Why is this evidence valid? You know, because someone might say, those are two completely different jobs. That's not good evidence. Like, yeah, AI might have taken that job, but there's no correlation between being a cashier and an artist. They might say, well, being a cashier is an unskilled position. You don't have to have very specific skills that um, one can't just gain from workplace experience. You don't have to like go and get a degree in it. It's not like a trade skill where you're running heavy machinery or something like that. Versus being an artist, you can't just do that. You can't just show up one day and do the job well enough to be an artist, you know, cashier, minimal training, you can check things out. Artists, that's not the case. It's a skilled position. So that's not good evidence. So you have to be able to not only present the evidence, but also argue why it's good evidence. How is this evidence supporting your thesis? Um, and so it takes a full paragraph. It's not enough just to give the, st the, the statistic. Um, you have to show why that statistic um, is valid. Um, it may take multiple pieces of evidence to fully support a given premise. Each paragraph should focus on a single premise and a single point of support for that premise. So you definitely shouldn't be mi mixing premises. I shouldn't in one paragraph be talking about AI taking jobs and how being an artist is a job outside of maybe the intro and the conclusion. Um, each paragraph should be focused on only one premise. And within that, each paragraph should only be focused on one premise uh, and one point of support for that premise. Um, so if that's a statistic, you definitely shouldn't have a statistic taken from one source and then a, a quote taken from another source, both being discussed at the same time. Um, the only kind of exception to that is if you're very late in a section, let's say you're sort of ending the first part of your body, you're on the last kind of bit of the section supporting this premise one maybe at the very end of that you might have a more complex discussion where you're kind of bringing some of those things together um, and having a paragraph that's touching on a few points but you've already discussed those things in other paragraphs you're just sort of synthesizing at the end in that case it's okay but generally speaking you don't want to be mixing evidence and mixing quotes and stuff like that um, in one paragraph it's all about clarity when it comes to argument the more clear your argument is, the stronger it is. And you definitely don't want your audience to feel kind of lost at any point. Um, and so hopefully that helps, giving that example and kind of how that approach um, would go um, with that specific argument. Um, 
Right. So I've done this like I've done all the other um, assignment sheets and that you have core tasks. And the way you read this is the core task, the thing that you absolutely must accomplish in order to get credit for the assignment are these outermost bullet points. The inner bullet points are guidance, are things to be considering while you are accomplishing the core task. So you only have four of them. So if all of this ends up confusing you, these inner bullet points, just ignore them. Um, you know, Hopefully they're helpful. Hopefully you're reading them and they're giving you things to think about and they're helping you write. But if they're sort of getting in the way and just making you confused, you can ignore all of all of this. What you can't ignore is this outermost um, task. So the first one is the core task of having a thesis that presents a clear argumentative position, right? And so you don't want a thesis statement um, that is not a position. Um, you know, you don't want a, a thesis statement that is, you know, the sky is blue or something that is just stating some sort of um, very common fact. It needs to be a position that is either true, that can be either true or false um, and is and is a definite position. Um, you want to avoid presenting a position too softly. Um, you don't want to, you know, strongly qualify where it's AI art may be kind of bad in some specific situations, right? That's that's too careful. That's that's too light of a position, um, and that's not going to be compelling. That's not going to make a reader want to read. Um, you can qualify it a little bit, especially if you're making a more inductive argument where you might say AI is likely to um, take away artists' jobs or something like that. That's fine. A little bit of a softening is fine, um, but you don't want to like overqualify and make it so soft that you're not really even taking a position at all. So it's important that you take a strong, clear, argumentative position. And some things to think about your thesis should be presented in your introduction. Again, this is just your thesis statement. Your introduction should provide relevant context that establishes why your argument matters to your audience. So this is just good practice in introductions in general to present some kind of context. Go back to our lessons in the analysis of, you know, what makes for good context. Um, you know, why does AI matter? What is it? A really good one is why does this conversation matter right now? Um, I have a student who is doing in comp two, they're doing their research paper on transhumanism. Um, you know, the idea of becoming like cyborgs and, and having integrating like technology into our bodies and things like that. Um, and his context is that there are technologies that exist right now that didn't exist 10 years ago. And that this idea of transhumanism has been around as science fiction for a long time. It's a conversation that's been around for a while in the abstract. But now we're at a new point in technological development that we're ready for the next phase of the discussion. We're ready to talk about real technologies that we find ourselves seeing sort of suddenly existing. And so what is it about your topic that the current moment in history calls for this conversation? It might be. Um, something that's going on socially, you know, you might be looking at something where you look at modern trends or something and say like, okay, this is really relevant to just modern humans. Um, there might be really specific events, political events, historical events, uh, ecological events that have occurred that call for this discussion. Um, and so really careful think what's something that sets up this discussion. Um, you know, some of you may have to think a little hard on it. You know, if your if your topic is something that's a little out there or just doesn't seem super relevant to people's everyday lives, you might have to kind of think a bit about how can I contextualize this in a way that is interesting, in a way that um, makes this matter to my reader. Right. So that's core task number one, a thesis that presents a clear argumentative position. Core task two, a body section that presents premises supporting the thesis. So we've already gone over this quite a bit, um, but each paragraph should focus on one single premise. So you shouldn't be presenting um, you know, multiple premises in one paragraph. And it, it's really best to 
um, divide up your essay into sections uh, your in your body where you know section one is premise one and you're keeping all of your discussion with premise one contained within that one section that one series of paragraphs and only once you fully explored premise one fully supported it um, and and proven it then you move on to premise two and you give that in a in a contained discussion um, through a series of paragraphs um, you can give more than one reason and or piece of evidence to support your premise. And so it will likely take multiple paragraphs to fully support a single premise. And again, it's something we've already discussed uh, a little bit, so I won't go over it anymore. Um, each paragraph should typically explore only one line of reasoning or one piece of evidence. So evidence is the one we've talked about most. The most obvious thing giving, you know, citation of statistics, quotes, stuff like that. You can also use reasoning. Now, if I'm talking about love, Especially if, if you are talking about things that are more abstract, um, you know, they're not, not might not be, you know, hard data on these things. And instead, you might have to focus on kind of reasoning your way through. You know, I'm going to define um, love in this way because, um, let's see, if I define love as... Um, agape. I don't know if you guys have studied like philosophy of love and stuff like that, but like brotherly love, like all love is, is, has this sort of purity to it. Um, and there's not any like statistics for that, but I could talk about how, um, you know, among the, the various kinds of love, you know, like romantic love and stuff like that, agape is the one that gives the most mental health, that it makes for the most stable relationships. And Stable relationships are are the best kind of are, are best for uh, for folks to have because it leads to the you know best mental health. And mental health is important because right. So you can kind of li line up your reasoning where this is important because this thing is important. This larger thing is important. That itself, and you want to get to a point where it's sort of self evident to the point where you can say, okay, I'm pretty sure that while my audience might have disagreed with a lot of the things that I've said. Um, they're not going to disagree with the idea that mental health is somewhat important, that mental health is something that we should try to achieve and is something that we should alter our behaviors um, in a way to accomplish. Um, so you can just use reasoning. Everything doesn't have to be hard statistics. Um, right. So there should be no unsupported claims. This is really where young writers go awry. Um, exercise judgment when composing your paragraphs. Young writers will often accidentally attempt to support one claim with another unsupported claim. The only way to support a claim is with evidence or through careful reasoning. And so what will happen is students will just use claims to support claims and they'll just make empty claims all the way down. And then there's no foundation. It's just empty claims going in a circle. And at no point is anything persuasive presented. At no point is, is evidence or support given, um, and so they're building their argument on quicksand, where the moment that a reader is skeptical, the moment the reader doesn't just grant them that the claim is true, the whole argument comes crumbling down. So I've given an example. Uh, the example is AI art is bad because AI is morally wrong, right? And that that's just the claim. Let's say that um, that's at the end of the paragraph, and I've said you know um, a bunch of things about how AI art is is bad and maybe i've given examples of what ai art is and then at the end i just say and ar is bad because ai art is morally wrong and then i just move on i just assume like okay the reader agrees that ai is bad because ai art or because ai is morally wrong and then i just move on to the next part of my argument or i just begin saying like therefore we should you know destroy all of the ai and and make it illegal for ai to do art um, that's not a convincing argument. Um, but to dive into kind of the the technical reasons for you know why that's wrong is in this example, the claim AI art is bad is being supported by the claim that AI is morally wrong. Both of these are claims. So these are claims that can be true or false, right? I could say AI art is bad, and that can be right or wrong. It can be true or false. Um, someone could say, like, no, AI art is good, and many people do. And that is itself being supported by the claim that AI is morally wrong, that AI itself is somehow morally wrong. Um, the way that this claim works is if AI is not morally wrong, then AI art being bad is not true, right? So AI art is bad if and only if AI 
is morally wrong. Therefore, if AI is morally correct, then AI art is good, right? Um, this is kind of how like logic and reasoning with with um, if then statements, if this, then this. So if this is not true, then this cannot be true. So this part of the claim is supporting this part of the claim. Both must be true for the for the claim as a whole to be true. For AI is morally wrong to itself be any kind of support, it must first be proven. So in an essay, I would have to have already proven that AI is morally wrong. I would have already have to have strongly shown and made an argument that persuades the reader that AI is morally wrong. If I've done that, then this claim is fine. I can I can make this claim and it is it is a a an argument. It is a, an argument that is you know at least valid to some degree. It is somewhat persuasive at at least. Without some previously given argument or evidence to prove that AI is morally wrong, then the claim AI art is bad is a baseless claim, right? There is no foundation to it. It is just something that is just air. It's just so many empty words and has no persuasiveness whatsoever unless a miracle happens and your reader just already grants all of that. They already believe these things um, to be true, which is extremely unlikely um, and you should absolutely never assume to be the case. Likely, the writer of this statement has assumed that the reader already is in agreement with them, which is the Achilles heel of most young writers. Most young writers assume that their reader believes the same thing they do, thinks the same way they do, sees the same things they do as far as logical connections. Um, and even those who are aware that that's not the case, it's hard to get outside of that. Just It's, an, it's what's called a cognitive bias and a, and a subconscious cognitive bias at that. We just subconsciously always believe this unless we are very conscious of it and are taking active measures um, to not believe that and to, to take into account that our reader is skeptical of us rather than believing what we believe. Um, we'll just fall into this pattern of making this assumption. Your reader hardly ever is in all is your reader hardly ever is already in perfect agreement with you and are more often in disagreement than they are in agreement. And so even if they are generally in agreement with you, they're not in perfect agreement. They may agree with your conclusion, but they may disagree with how you get there. They may uh, disagree with your premises, right? Um, and so just assume that your reader is skeptical. Assume that your reader disagrees somewhat with absolutely every single thing that you say. Um, that anything beyond the sky is blue um, is not granted and it is your burden to prove absolutely everything that you say so points will be deducted for every baseless or unsupported claim given in your essay to avoid deducted points make sure that you have evidence or reasoning for every single statement that you make the key to a good argument is to make as few claims as possible ensuring that each claim that you do make is strongly supported with plenty of source evidence or highly specific and detailed reasoning. Take absolutely nothing for granted. Every claim you make, every single statement that you make that can be either true or false is a link in a chain. Every link you add has a chance of being a weak link, and it takes one weak link for the chain to break. So it's very important that you understand that only add a link to the chain of your argument if it is very strong if you can support it if you can show that it is it is a strong link so be very very careful so that is the second core task a body section that pre uh, presents premises supporting the thesis core task three ev evidence is cited correctly so this is part really of this um core task, um, but it's extremely important that you cite things. If you um, if you give some sort of, of, of statistic, even if you allude to it, um, you have to cite something. Um, it is not evidence unless you have a citation for it. Um, now, obviously, this doesn't apply to pure reasoning if you're just reasoning your way through things, but even then, it's best to find some kind of evidence to support that. Um, 
Here's the big one, the one that students really, really struggle with. Never speak on behalf of a person or group without a source that proves it. So many students just take for granted. They'll hear things or they understand that just sort of socially there are certain attitudes that are held. Um, and they'll just sort of repeat those things as though it's just common knowledge. Well, very, very little, if anything, can be taken as just common knowledge in academic writing. So, for example, you want to avoid statements such as many people say or anything to that effect or even implying that this is something this is a position held by many people. Uh, unless you have a source in which people are directly saying that exact thing um, or a source in which polls have been taken that indicate that specific attitude. So if you have you can only speak on behalf of a group if that group have themselves represented that position in some way. And again, you can do it through direct quotations given or polls that are taken. Um, without something like that, you cannot speak on behalf of persons or groups. Um, and you have to be really careful. You don't want to um, put words in folks' mouths. You don't want to extend their position. So if they say something really specific, you can't then just generalize that and say, like, because they said this one very specific thing in this very specific situation, that means they think the same thing for all other even vaguely related situations. You have to be extremely careful and nuanced in how you present thoughts that are not uniquely your own. So it's very it's best to just not make any claims outside of your premises. Your premises are, are, are the core claims you're trying to make, and you only want to support those. You don't want to add any extra claims, add extra statements that can either be true or false, because that's adding another another link. And the biggest one, again, that I see students struggle with is speaking on behalf of groups or implying attitudes of society. That's that's really the biggest one that I see is like as a society, um, where in reality, the student believes they're speaking on behalf of society, which they don't have the ethos to do in the first place. But really, all they're doing is repeating things that have been stated by their very local group. Maybe they're part of a a small community online or something like that. And then they're just parroting things they've heard, parroting kind of a, a vibe that they've, that they've, um, you know, experienced or something like that. Um, but really what they're doing um, is speaking for a group that they have no authority to speak for. Um, so be really careful of that. Um, some statements such as the sky is blue is common sense or in terms of logic, self-evident. Some claims to you may seem self-evident, but remember that your audience is inherently skeptical of your position and expects for you to have strong support for every single thing that you say. Um, and so just understand that the, the thing that I was taught is imagine after every single sentence, excuse me, after every single sentence, your reader says, so what? Can your essay handle that? If they say, so what, and then there's no support for it, or they just assume that your reader has not found that compelling, um, can you imagine your reader saying, so what, and that not being satisfied in some way? Or can you point to somewhere else in the essay where that so what is answered, where you say, you know, agape love is the purest form of love, and they say, so what? You can say, well, oh, well, here I show why that matters, why pure love is better than romantic love because it's better for mental health. And they say, well, so what mental health? Well, because mental health, you know, contributes to happiness um, and happiness is very important. And they might say, you know, well, so what? And you might say, well, that's silly, right? It's silly to think that happiness isn't important. At that point, you can say like the audience would stop their so whating when you get to that, that strong foundational point where it's self-evident where you can't imagine a reader saying, so what to that? Um, but this takes really good judgment. So you have to be really careful um, because though it may seem self-evident to you, that's not necessarily the case. And this is really the, the problem all writers face is how far does this so what go? How far does common sense go? How far does self-evidence go? And that's something you just have to get a feel for. You have to be really critical and, how you understand your audience, how you understand your audience's attitudes about things, their degree of skepticism. There's a lot of things you have to be very critical about to 
kind of gauge their ability to say so what to something. Um, and this is really something that it can't be taught. It's something that you just have to have a feel for. And it changes with every single audience, every single essay, every single topic. It just is, is a constantly evolving thing and it's never the same twice. Um, and you just have to have a uh, uh, gather skill with it and an intuition for these things. Um, so going uh, along with evidence is cited correctly, you may cite using MLA or APA style citation. So if you are in the humanities, meaning, you know, English, philosophy, languages, um, the histories, um, then you are MLA. If you're in the sciences, which is the hard sciences, biology, chemistry, um, if you are in like nursing or any of the health sciences, if you're in psychology or the social sciences, um, all of those are APA. Whichever you choose, you must have both a works cited page, which is your reference page at the end. Hopefully you've done several of those um, and your in-text citation. So in-text citations are the little parentheticals where you at the end of the sentence where you give a quote or something, you open a parentheses, you give the author's name, the page number, and then a closed parentheses. Um, in APA, it's author's last name and the date that the work was published, along with the page number if it's a quote. With MLA, it's the um, author's last name and the, just the page number, I believe. Um, and we'll I'll likely do a, a day in class where we'll go over this very quickly. Um, so those are the big ones for site evidence correctly. So that's um, core task three. The final one, a conclusion that leaves an impression. So argument is one of the um, the genres that your conclusion has the highest impact. Um, in analysis, it's your introduction, the way that you set the stage for your analysis, the way that you create context for your analysis is the most important. The way you hook your reader um, into caring about this analysis and this situation that calls for it is extremely important. In your argument, it's the conclusion, that final note, because an argument is all about persuasion. And now analysis is not a very persuasive text there's some persuasion going on but it doesn't hinge on your ability to persuade your reader that your analysis is somehow like the true objective analysis that's just silly an argument you are trying to kind of convince them that your argument is objectively the the most perfect argument and and the conclusion is really where the the heaviest hitting persuasive appeals are going to happen um so your conclusion should remind your reader of your position, restating your thesis statement. So argument is we were all taught in, in school to restate the thesis at the end. Um, argument is the one where you really need to do that. Analysis, meh. Um, obviously narrative, all of these things go out the window with narrative. Um, but with an argumentative essay, it is very important that your reader has a very strong and clear grasp of what your ultimate position is. Um, remember, the success of your essay depends not on your conclusion, um, in this case, not conclusion of the essay, your argumentative conclusion, your, your, your main claim. The success of your essay depends not on your conclusion, but on your ability to prove your premises. Your conclusion is a perfect place to discuss how you have proven that your premises are true. This is your last chance to show, I've proven these things. At this point, you should believe that AI is 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 bad for artists or something like that. Once you have shown that your premises have been proven, then it is appropriate to discuss how your conclusion logically follows from those premises. So you'll have a discussion. Um, and then I give an example. For example, in the conclusion that follows from the example argument given earlier, I would first discuss how I have shown that AI does in fact take jobs. So that was premise one. I would discuss in a sentence or two, kind of highlight the key points for how that has been proven to be true. You know, statistics show it proven to true. So kind of take the highlights, the kind of spark notes from that section of your essay and represent it um, quickly in a, in a strong way. Then I would discuss how I have shown that being an artist is indeed a job as much as anything else. So that would be premise two, section two of the body, 
I would kind of give the highlights there and make sure that my reader is reminded like, hey, we've proven this. This has been shown. Um, and, and hopefully at that point, they they agree with you. They they see what you're what you're laying down um, and they say like, OK, yeah, I get it. I buy that. So once those two premises and have been discussed and you've shown like, hey, we've proven this, then and only then would I discuss how because these things have been proven to be true. Premise one, premise two, then my conclusion, AI will take artist jobs must be true. Right? At that point, one or two sentences that show if you believe these things, as I have shown, then you must believe that AI will take artist jobs. Um, it should feel when they get to the end, like you're not really presenting anything special. It should get to the end. They go, yeah, obviously. That is the mark of a really great argument. It shouldn't feel like you're having to do a lot of heavy lifting persuasively at the end. The heavy lifting should be in the pr improving your premises. The best arguments, it gets to the end, and it feels like you are just presenting common sense. It feels like this all is just you stating the absolutely most obvious basic information. If so, that is an extremely successful argument. right? If, and, and think about... When we're around people who are very, very confident, they have that persuasive quality where everything they say, you're just kind of nodding along like, yeah. The reason that those people have so much charisma is they just state everything as fact. They state everything as though they're just stating obvious things, and that makes them very persuasive. So that's kind of what you want to practice here is that all of this just follows. I've already – the argument's already been successful back there right i've already persuaded you here we're just tying the bow on 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 the end um right so make sure you're not just discussing the conclusion and make sure you're not doing too much heavy lifting persuasively your your efforts should be in the body not in the conclusion the conclusion should just really be you saying the obvious presenting these things as you know logically entailed your conclusion logically follows and that all of this is just the fallout of the premises being true. And then your conclusion should end with a final remark that leaves your reader with something valuable, something that they can hold on to and do something with. The last thing you want to end with is just, all right, now you know, and then it's over. Um, remember that you're contextualizing all this around a problem or a, a pressing philosophical question, something that matters. If it's something that matters, then it should change your reader in some way. There should be some kind of shift either in the way they think um, or in the way that they engage with the world around them. You know, there should be some kind of positive, positive in the sense of like a really existing, you know, a change in their reality. It may be a question that keeps them thinking about what you've been discussing and, and extends it to, you know, their own um uh, engagement beyond just you telling them what to think but now okay i've shown this i've shown you how to think about this thing now here's the next thing to think about something that you planted the seed now it's a question that will continue cultivating that seed in your reader um, or it may be an appeal for them to change how they act or how they see the world carefully consider what you want your reader to do with what your essay has given them and then craft a sentence or two that will nudge them in that direction. So really carefully and critically think, you know, what do I want my reader to do with this? You've spent all this time writing. You're not doing this for your health. I mean, obviously you're doing it because you want to get a good grade in the class, but in reality, your writing is meant to, to bring about some change you want to see in the world. So consider what that is exactly. What is it that you want your reader to like physically do with this information, with the fruits of your labor and then nudge them in that direction to make sure that that occurs. And so that is core task number four. So altogether, you should have a thesis that presents a clear argumentative position, a body section that presents premises supporting that thesis. You should have evidence that is cited correctly, and you should have a conclusion that leaves an impression. Um. Now, a note, some, some students are likely going to struggle with, well, how do I take my topic and turn it into an argument? Um, as mentioned earlier, arguments kind of exist on a spectrum from addressing you know, modern, real-world 
problems or kind of exploring you know, philosophical questions. So arguments that explore a solution to a modern problem will build positions around a certain course of action, i.e. we ought to do this in order to achieve the best solution for your topic rather than that. Arguments that explore more philosophical questions or ideas are more focused on how we should understand or define something, i.e. we ought to define your topic in this way rather than that way, or your topic has been misunderstood and should be understood in this way rather than that way. It is important to consider that consider your topic and determine if you should build a position that is focused on a grounded solution to a real world problem or approach your topic from a more abstract perspective, focusing on things like how certain ideas or terms are defined or understood. So kind of think about what, what work do I need to do to affect my audience the way that I want to. There are a great many ways to approach argument. Ultimately, use your instincts. You know, Identify something that you care about, and often you kind of already have an inkling of how to go about that. Um, there's not one way. You might approach things and say like, okay, well, I'm looking at a you know grounded real world problem, but I feel like the problem there is not in a specific solution, but rather in the way we define the problem, right? You know, one of my favorite, you know, ways of thinking about a lot of the friction that we see in society these days is a lot of people will present things as, you know, this culture against this culture, or, you know, this against that, this group against that group. And then people will come along and say, like, no, it's all, it's all class. It's the rich versus the poor. It, we have a complete misunderstanding of this. We we break it down to like race or something like that. No, those are those are false divisions. Instead, we should change the way that we understand all these struggles to be class struggles. That it's the people in power, meaning most often the folks with the most capital, um, you know, oppressing or suppressing the folks who don't have capital and, and keeping them from achieving capital. So this is an this is something that is always really interesting to me. The paper, the way that problems that we see as being very grounded, very real, uh, and reframing them, saying like, it's all because of a misunderstanding. So you can do that. Or you can look at, okay, the way that, you know, we define love has led to all these problems. You know, there's a lot of really interesting things about looking at how like dating apps and stuff like work and how, okay, well, less people are dating than ever before. Um, it may seem like it's because of how we define love, but it's actually not. It's actually because of the way that these technologies work. And so this big abstract thing of love, I'm actually going to talk about and make an argument in a more grounded way, focusing on something very specific and, and real. So there's a lot of different ways you can approach it. Um, just kind of use your instincts and focus on a topic um, primarily that interests you and one that you kind of already have a belief about, you know, that all of our dating problems are because of Tinder, not because of culture or something like that. I don't know. Um, and let that kind of guide you. And the big thing to do is kind of think first about what's my conclusion, what's kind of the belief that I'm trying to present as a position and then build your premises from there. Um, so that's my, my, suggestion. Um, so now on to the technical requirements. So this will be a three to five page essay, which is about 750 to 1,250 words. Most um, double spaced pages um, contain about 250 words. Double spaced, 11 to 12 point legible font. Um, make sure you have a cover letter, reference the assignment or the, uh, the syllabus and the cover letter policy there. Um, Primarily make sure that you include who your audience is and what you are trying to accomplish. This, this is the, the most important essay for the cover letter. It is extremely important that I know who your audience is and exactly what you're trying to accomplish with it. Um, without those things, I cannot gauge the success of your essay. Um, and it's important to understand you may be a fantastic writer and you craft a beautiful argument. Um, but if the audience that you've chosen um, say so you've you've written a very eloquent you know highbrow essay with lots of of um you know beautiful language and stuff like that but it's written for everyday folk um that doesn't work 
right? And so even though it's a beautifully written essay, maybe for uh, you know one kind of audience, because of the audience you've chosen, this essay is unsuccessful and it might be a B. Whereas if it had been written for another, you know, more appropriate, uh, appropriate in the sense of the decisions you've made as a writer, um, it might be an A. And same with what you want to accomplish, especially when I'm looking at that conclusion. Are you leaving a final impression on your reader that has synergy with what you're trying to accomplish? If you're trying to get your reader to act in a really specific way, but you leave them with a, an abstract question that in no way spurs them to action, that's not successful, right? That's not accomplishing what you're setting out to do. And so if you are a gifted writer, I don't care. What I care about is your ability to, you know, set a task for yourself and accomplish it through the decisions you make as a writer. I'm not interested in great writers throwing darts in the dark. If anything, that just frustrates me. Um, and if you are someone who you're, you haven't had as much chance to practice writing, you don't identify as someone with, you know, strong writing skills, I don't care either. What I care about is, are you making decisions in the text that make sense? Do I see a relationship between who you're, I have identified as your audience and the way that you're writing your paper? Do I see synergy between how you are, you know, writing your conclusion, say, and what you ultimately are trying to accomplish with the essay as a whole? If there's synergy there, that's an A in my mind, even if there are some technical problems, even if it's not you know, the strongest, you know, sentence level writing, I'm more looking at those, those, those more whole structures, the way that you are, uh, you know, forming the, those broad strokes. So uh, make sure that cover letter is strongly considered, carefully written, um, beyond just audience and um, what you're trying to accomplish. You can also request specific kinds of feedback so make sure you read that cover letter policy and understand the options available to you. Um, not only what is absolutely required, but also um, what options you have as far as feedback goes. And then unique to this assignment, I also am requiring one multimodal element. Multimodal just means a mode other than writing. So this can be a picture. You can find a picture online um, that's relevant. Um, it can be like a graph. If you're presenting statistics, you find a source that has statistics and it has the statistics, my Lord, statistics given as like a graph or something. You can slap that in there and that can be your multimodal element. As far as images go, you can do it in the body of the text. If you want to use it as an illustration of an idea, you can use it on your um, title page. If you want to kind of open the essay with an image um, or something like that, however you want to use it. And your multimodal element ultimately can be any non pure text element um so get creative as much as you want i'm pretty open-minded as far as what i consider multimodal um i've had some interesting multimodal elements given before so the sky's the limit so that's everything um this is run quite long i think so i don't want to go into much more detail again uh it's due 12 5 um, which will be the last day of class. Um, if you have any questions, um, do let me know. Um, this is this is a, um, I think not as complex as maybe the rhetorical analysis, but it is a fairly complex assignment. Um, and as we got about two weeks behind across the course of the semester. Um, and so there weren't as many lessons as I had, I had hoped that we could have done um, on argument. We were really only able to do kind of the, the, most fundamental um, elements of, of argument. Um, so if you have questions, please do let me know. Um, and and yeah, I can't wait to see what, what all you come up with. As a final note, um, I do anticipate that you'll still be working with topics, um, the, the same talk you've been using all semester, specifically uh, from your analysis. If you went off that topic for your narrative, that's okay. You can come back to it with the argument. You can change your topic if you want. I would like to see, you know, using that experience you had with the analysis. Hopefully the idea is that you did the analysis on the topic, which built up your background knowledge. It built up your understanding of the topic. And now you can use that experience, that that background knowledge that you've built up to inform your argument. 
Now, if you have just lost all interest in that topic or, you know, the analysis just wasn't a good experience for you um, or there's just another argument that you're really interested in making, you are welcome to to change your topic. Just let me know um, I because we spend a lot of time generating our topics at the beginning of the semester. Um, and, you know, I, I signed off on everyone's topics because I wanted to make sure that you were working with a strong topic that would, you know, would carry you. Um, through the semester. So if you do decide to change topics, just let me know what you're going to change it to so that I can make sure that it I don't foresee problems down the road um, with it to make sure that it's a topic that, you know, will allow you to take an argumentative position and, and things like that. Um, so do let me know if you decided to change topics. If you aren't changing topics, if you're doing the same topic that you did um, with your analysis, you don't have to tell me. Um, I'll just assume. Um, right. So that's everything. I'm going to hop off. I'm going to upload this to YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a great break. Um, had a great break. Um, and uh, yeah.